You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Folks, I get faxes and letters all the time. I've got to read you a fax and uh, explain a couple of things. Says Mr. Cooper, on January 16th, 1995, you scolded us, your listeners, for spreading rumors. Then you turn right around and read a story out of a newspaper that you said was unproven. It is hard to believe our military would allow a leak of this magnitude to take place. As you said, there are no leaks. Do you really believe that Clinton would order the commanders of United States submarines to turn in their launch keys? Mr. Cooper, will you please use some of your airtime to teach, not spoon-feed us, your listeners, on how to research and prove the rumors that we hear? Not all of us have had the pleasure of having the U.S. military teach us the difference between truth and fiction. Good shows on 11795. Looking forward to tonight's show. Folks, I want you to understand, unless you can show me a contract with my signature on it saying that I owe you something, then you can forget all this crap, because that's what it is. I don't owe you anything. In fact, most of you are getting much more than you ever will deserve from me, and I've placed my life on the line. I've taken food out of the mouths of my family members to try to save this country. I've been seriously injured in this fight. So, don't do this to me. You haven't got the credentials, nor the time on this battlefield to do this to me. And I get this kind of crap all the time. A rumor is something that's unfounded, that has no source, that you cannot point to, that you cannot track down. I did not spread a rumor. I read you the story from a newspaper. I cited the source of the newspaper, not only the source of the newspaper, but the newswire service that furnished the newspaper with the story. I did not say that Clinton ordered anybody. I said the newspaper said it. And I don't know if they've turned in their launch keys or not. I suspect if they were ordered to, that they either have or will very shortly. And as you heard last night, and you will continue to hear tonight, whether they have done it yet or not, they will do it at some very near time in the future. And no, I'm not going to teach you how to do research. That was the job of your parents and your school teachers. And if you didn't learn it there, then you better get down to the library and find a book on how to research. Talk to the librarian on how to use the library and learn it yourself. You see, I can only do so much for you people. There was one guy I heard tonight that was led by the Lord to WWCR. Until I dumped on him, and now he's a Tom Valentine listener, and i got to tell you, if there's any more panty-waist, puke-faced cowards out there, you can get your butt back two hours and be a Tom Valentine listener also, because I don't have time for you. And frankly, my dear Scarlet, I don't give a damn.
This is from document 55, October 24, 1950, United Nations. Addressed by President Truman to the General Assembly, extract October 24, 1950, on cooperative disarmament. And I'm going to excerpt paragraphs out of this speech. Quote, disarmament is the course which the United States would prefer to take. It is the course which most nations would like to adopt. It is the course which the United Nations from its earliest beginnings has been seeking to follow. First, the plan must include all kinds of weapons. Outlawing any particular kind of weapon is not enough. The conflict in Korea bears tragic witness to the fact that aggression, whatever the weapons used, brings frightful destruction. Second, the plan must be based on unanimous agreement. A majority of nations is not enough. No plan of disarmament can work unless it includes every nation having substantial armed forces. One-sided disarmament is a sure invitation to aggression. Third, the plan must be foolproof. If real disarmament were achieved, the nations of the world acting through the United Nations could join in a greatly enlarged program of mutual aid. As the cost of maintaining armaments decreased, every nation could greatly increase its contributions to advancing human welfare. All of us could then pool even greater resources to support the United Nations in its war against want. Harry Truman was the 33rd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite. In September of 1950, this article appeared in the New Age. It is the magazine of the House of the Temple of the Supreme Council of the 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. And I quote, God's plan is dedicated to the unification of all races, religions, and creeds. This plan, dedicated to the new order of things, is to make all things new. A new nation, a new race, a new civilization, and a new religion. A non-sectarian religion that has already been recognized and called the religion of the great light. Looking back into history, we can easily see that the guiding hand of providence has chosen the Nordic people to bring in and unfold the new order of the world. Records clearly show that 95% of the colonists were Nordics, Anglo-Saxons. Providence has chosen the Nordics because the Nordics have prepared themselves and have chosen God. The Nordics are God's chosen people always looking for more light on the mission of life. Just as Providence has chosen, chosen the Jewish race, the children of Israel, to bring into the world righteousness by carrying the Ten Commandments, which emphasize, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, so also Providence has chosen the Nordic race to unfold the new age of the world, a Novus Ordo Cyclorum. One of the first of the Nordics to reach the New World was the Viking, Leif Erikson. He sailed from Norway to bring to his people in Ireland a new message. The message of the Christian people in Ireland's new message. The message of the Christian God. But Providence moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. And so Leif the Lucky was sent by Providence to the New World. From the abundance of grapes found there, Leif Erikson called the place Vinland. It is easy to sense that Leif Erikson was sent by the guiding hand of Providence to bring the Norse spirit of the All-Father to the shores of the New World. The Nordics are the highest branch of the fifth Aryan civilization. The Latins are of the fourth Aryan civilization, and the American race will be the sixth Aryan civilization. This new and great civilization is like an American beauty rosebud, ready to open and send its wonderful fragrance to all the world. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Thomas Paine, and many others of the founders of the new nation and the new world were Nordics. Thomas Paine, the spark plug of the American Revolution, loved God but hated sectarianism. In These Are the Times, he wrote, 
we have it in our power to begin the world all over again. A situation similar to the present hath not happened since the days of Noah till now. The birthday of a new world is at hand. As stated before, God's plan in America is a non-sectarian plan. Our Constitution is non-sectarian. Our great American public schools, God's chosen schools, are non-sectarian. The great spirit behind this great nation is non-sectarian. Our great American public schools have never taken away from any child the freedom of will, freedom of spirit, or freedom of mind. That is the divine reason that great God our King has chosen the great American public schools to pave the way for the new race, the new religion, and the new civilization that is taking place in America. Any mother, father, or guardian who is responsible for the taking away of freedom of mind, freedom of will, or freedom of spirit is the lowest criminal on this earth because they take away from that child the God-given right to become a part of God's great plan in America for the dawn of the new age of the world, end quote. No conspiracy? No plan for a new world order? No movement toward one world religion? One world government? September 1950 and the New Age. Look it up yourself. In the United States Code, annotated. Constitution of the United States, annotated. Amended, amendments 1, 2, 3. Annotations from federal and state courts. Purpose. In interpreting and applying this amendment, purpose of amendment to assure continuation and render possible the effectiveness of the militia must be considered. U.S. versus Miller. Arkansas, 1939, 59, State Court, 816, 307, U.S., 174, 83, Law Edition, 1206. Purpose of this amendment, guaranteeing the right of the people to keep and bear arms, was to preserve the effectiveness and assure the continuation of the state militia. U.S. v. Oaks, C.A., Kansas, 1977, 564, F. 2nd, 384. Serti Arori denied, 98, State Court, 1493, 435, U.S., 926, 55, L. Ed., 2nd, 521. The amendment was designed to foster a well-regulated militia as necessary to the security of a free state. Cases v. U.S., CCA, Puerto Rico, 1942, 131, F., 2nd, 916. Sotiereri denied 63, S. Court, 1431, 319, U.S. 770, 87, L. Ed., 1718, rehearing denied, 65, S. Court, 1010, 324, U.S. 889, 89, L. Ed., 1437. The hour of the time is the only place that you get the truth, ladies and gentlemen. It's the only place that you ever learn what's really happening, who's bringing it about, what you should do. And we even tell you where we got it. Collective right of militia is limited to keeping and bearing arms, the possession or use of which has a reasonable relationship to a well-regulated militia. U.S. versus Warren, C.A., Ohio, 1976, 530, F. Second, 103. Sertiorari denied, 96, S. Court, 3168, 426, U.S., 948, 49, L. Ed. 2nd, 1185. Right to bear arms is not an absolute bar to congressional regulation of the use or possession of firearms, and its guarantee extends only to use or possession which has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficiency of a well-regulated militia. Cody versus U.S. C.A. Mo. That's Missouri, 1972. 460 F. Second, 34. Sotiereri denied. 93 S. Court, 454. 409 U.S. 1010. 34 L. Ed. Second, 303. See also Burton versus Sills, 1968. 248 A. Second, 
521. 53. New Jersey, 86. Appeal dismissed, 89. S Court, 1486. 394. U.S. 812. 22. L. Ed. Second, 748. Rawlings versus Illinois Department of Law Enforcement, 1979. 391. N. E. Second, 758. 29. Illinois, December, 33373. Ill. Illinois Appeal 3rd, 267, Brown v. City of Chicago, 1969, 250, N.E. 2nd, 129, 42, Illinois 2nd, 501, State v. Skinner, 1973, 203, N.W. 2nd, 161, 189, Nebraska, 457. Next time you see a gun control nut, flash this stuff in his face. I couldn't believe that supposedly intelligent militia leaders went to the Donahue show without the quotes and the backing in the law that they needed to beat that socialist communist puke at his own game. The man who flashed the second article in Amendment to the World and left out the phrase, the right of the people. A person's right to bear arms as guaranteed by this amendment does not extend to pistols or other readily concealable weapons. Rather, that guarantee protects only right to be armed with weapons suitable for use by militia in warfare and for the general defense of the community. Guido versus Deere, 1975, 375, New York, S. 2nd, 826, 84. Miscellaneous 2nd, 110, modified on other grounds, 387, New York, S. 2nd, 720, 54, A.D. 2nd, 86. The word arms in the connection, we find it in the Constitution of the United States, refers to the arms of a militia man or soldier, and the word is used in its military sense. The arms of the infantry soldier are the musket and bayonet of cavalry and dragoons, the saber, holster, pistols, and carbine. Of the artillery, the field piece, siege gun, and mortar with sidearms. English versus State, 1872-35, Texas, 476. This amendment guarantees a collective rather than an individual right. U.S. versus Warren, C.A., Ohio, 1976, 530, F, second, 103, Sociarari denied, 96, S. Court, 3168, 426, U.S. 948, 49, L. Ed., second, 1185. Constitutional right to keep and bear arms applies only to the right of the state to maintain militia and not to individuals' right to bear arms. Stevens versus U.S. C. A. Kentucky, 1971. 440. F. Second, 144. See also application of Cassidy, 1944. 51. New York. S. Second, 202. 268. Appellate Division, 282. Re-argument denied, 63. N.Y.S. 2nd, 840. 270. Appellate Division, 1046. Affirmed, 73. N.E. 2nd, 41. 296. New York, 926. Com vs. Davis, 1976. 343. N.E. 2nd, 847. 369. Massachusetts, 886. Photos vs. City of Toledo, 1969. 250 NE 2nd 916 19 Ohio miscellaneous 147 Harris versus State 1967 432 P 2nd 92983 Nevada 404 this amendment does not imply any general constitutional right for individuals to bear arms and form private armies. Vietnamese Fishermen's Association versus Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, D.C., Texas, 1982, 543, F, Supplement, 198. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand what I'm telling you. You don't have a right to keep a weapon to hunt. You don't have a right to keep a weapon to protect your house. You only have a right guaranteed by the second article in amendment to keep a right for the protection of the state and the Constitution. The right to keep and bear arms is for the militia. I've been telling you this over and over and over again. You must join a militia or lose your right to keep and bear arms. 
You must. The militia cannot be restricted on any arms, as you've already heard. You may have a militia of artillery. You may have a militia of armor. You may have a militia of cavalry, cavalry if you think horses are going to cut the mustard. And you can have an infantry militia. But you must have a militia, or your right to keep and bear arms is in dire jeopardy. The word arms in the connection, we find it in the Constitution of the United States, refers to the arms of a militiaman or soldier. And the word is used in its military sense. The arms of the infantry soldier are the musket and bayonet of cavalry and dragoons, the saber, holster, pistol, and carbine of the artillery, the field piece, siege gun, and mortar with sidearms. You must be a legal and lawful militia. If you are not, you will lose your right to keep and bear arms because this amendment does not apply any general constitutional right for individuals to bear arms and form private armies. There are many, many more cases listed here. Self-defense is not substantive right conferred directly by this amendment, and thus no constitutional right of federal employee was violated by her discharge upon basis of assault incident in which employee claimed to have acted in self-defense. Fields versus Harris, C.A., Missouri, 1982, 675, F. 2nd, 219. Certiorari, denied, 103, S. Court, 153, 459, U.S., 869, 74, L. Ed, 2nd, 128. This amendment does not contemplate within its express limitation on powers of the national government granting defendant right to carry two sword-like weapons in his belt for the purposes stated, namely, that he might need them and that he wanted to be prepared. Masters versus State, Texas, Appeal, 3rd District, 1983, 653, S.W. 2nd, 944, Affirmed, 685, S.W. 2nd, 654, Certiorari Denied, 106, S. Court, 155, 88, L. Ed, 2nd, 128. Applicability to state or federal government. Supreme Court has stated that the Second Amendment declares that it shall not be infringed, but this means no more than that it shall not be infringed by Congress. This is one of the amendments that has no other effect than to restrict the powers of the national government. Therefore, right to keep and bear arms under this amendment is not fundamental right which state cannot regulate. Quilici v. Village of Morton Grove, C.A., Illinois, 1982, 695, F. 2nd, 261, Certiorari Denied, 104, S. Court, 194, 464, U.S. 863, 78, L. Ed. 2nd, 170. Are you beginning to get the message? I've been trying to teach you, and I look out, and I get letters, and I see what you're doing, and you send me your militia material, and I see that you're nothing but a bunch of children playing games. And you'd better straighten it up real quick. Real quick. Guarantee of right to keep and bear arms under this amendment <clears throat> protects not an individual right, but a collective right in the people as a group to serve as militia and imposes no limitation on the state legislature's power to prohibit individuals from carrying deadly weapons where the prohibition will not interfere with the preservation of efficiency of the militia. Application of Atkinson, Minnesota, 1980, 291, NW 2nd, 396. Right to bear arms under state constitution or state decisional law is not an absolute right. Right may be circumscribed by conditions under which it is sought to be asserted. U.S. versus Romero, C.A.N.M., 1973, 484, F. 2nd, 1324. See also State versus Rupp, Ohio, or excuse me, Iowa, 1979, 282, N.W. 2nd, 125. State versus Dawson, 1968, 159, S.E. 2nd, 1272. North Carolina, 535, Bristow versus State, Alabama. CR, Appeals, 1982, 418, SO, 2nd, 927. 
This amendment places no limitation on power of state legislators to enact gun control legislation. People v. Morrell, 1984, 475, NYS, 2nd, 648, 101, AD, 2nd, 927. There is no absolute constitutional right of an individual to possess a firearm. Thompson v. Doretta, D.C., Utah, 1982, 549, F, SUP, 297, appeal dismissed. 709 F. 2nd, 1343. See also State v. Winkleman, 1981, 442, N.E. 2nd, 811, 2nd, Ohio, App. 3rd, 465, 2, O.B.R. 561. Municipal ordinance requiring that persons seeking to possess handguns first obtain identification card in order to demonstrate their entitlement to possess such weapon did not violate this amendment since it did not infringe upon maintenance of well-regulated militia right which this amendment seeks to protect. Purpose furthered by ordinance of safeguarding public as much as possible from dangers of illegal weapons is proper subject for reasonable regulation under police power. Mosier versus City of Dayton, 1976, 358, N.E. 2nd, 540, 2. 0.0, 3rd, 412, 48, Ohio, State, 2nd, 243. I bet you're paying attention, aren't you? City ordinance prohibiting registration of any handgun after April 10th, 1982, unless it was validly registered to current owner and city before April 10th does not infringe on constitutionally protected right. Sklar v. Byrne, D.C., Illinois, 1983, 556, F. Sup, 736, affirmed, 727, F. 2nd, 633. Even where this amendment is applicable, it does not constitute an absolute barrier to congressional regulation of firearms. U.S. v. Warren, C.A., Ohio, 1976, 530, F. 2nd, 103, Certiorari denied, 96, S. Court, 3168, 426, U.S. 948, 49, L. Ed. 2nd, 1185. Regulation of dealers and firearms under Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act, 18 U.S.C.A., Section 921, etc., et does not infringe on rights under this amendment of people to keep and bear arms, absent a showing that licensing in any way destroys or impairs efficiency of a well-regulated militia. U.S. v. Gross, D.C., Indiana, 1970, 313, F. Sup, 1330, affirmed, 451, F. 2nd, 1355. U.S.C.A., Section 5861, under which defendants were convicted of possession of unregistered firearms, did not violate defendants' right to bear arms. U.S. v. Brimley, C.A., 6, 1976, 529, F. 2nd, 103. National Firearms Act 26 USCA LRC 1939 subsection 2720 2733 3260 through 3263 did not violate this amendment in absence of showing of any reasonable relationship between such weapons and a well regulated militia US versus Miller Arkansas 1939 59 state court 1816 307 US 174 83 LED 1206 you must have a militia. You must have a militia. This, ladies and gentlemen, is from... Well, let's take a break. I need a sip of coffee.
Swiss America Treaty. They care about this country just as much as I do. They care about the law as much as I do. They care about responsible and good Americans just as much as I do. They don't want to see you go down the tubes. They believe in the message of this broadcast. Over the years that we've been together, I've become very good friends with Craig Smith and Gene Miller and Joanne and a couple of others who work and have worked for a long time at Swiss America Trading. They're good people. I've come to know Craig Smith so much and so well. And I believe that he's such a good man that I don't believe that he would ever consciously do anything to hurt anyone. And so as he backs his product with guarantees and with assurances and with a buyback policy, and as he records the terms of every agreement so that there can be no misunderstanding and so that the tape can be played back in case there is a misunderstanding, I back Craig Smith and Swiss America Trading. You see, I've given my promise to you that if anything ever goes wrong there, I'll get with Craig Smith, and I assure you we will make it right really quick. You need real money. The only real money in this entire world, according to the law of the United States of America, the Constitution for the United States of America, the United States Code, the only real money is gold and silver coin. The money you have in your wallet is counterfeit. According to law, those who counterfeited it and those who debased our coinage should be tried, and the penalty under the law is death. That should tell you a little of how far we've gone. But when we begin to bring it back, if you don't have real money, you're going to be in trouble. There's going to be a long period of hardships for everyone. I can assure you of that, for I've already fought in one war, and I never dreamed that I'd have to fight another one. And I'm working as hard as I can to wake up enough people so it, that it will not happen. I've helped found a new third party, the Constitution Party, to try to ensure that no one gets hurt. Because I believe we still have one last chance to do it legally, lawfully, without bloodshed. But if it doesn't work, ladies and gentlemen, and you're not prepared, you will suffer. I can assure you, and I can tell you with no hesitation whatsoever that if we do not wake up enough people to affect the change, to restore this nation to Republican government, blood will run in the streets of America. I call Swiss America Trading right now, 1-800-289-2646. 1-800-289-2646. Take care of yourself and your family. And if you don't want to do it with Swiss America Trading folks, please call somebody. Please get some real money under your belt. If this economic system collapses, the paper you have in your wallet will be worth less than the ashes in your fireplace. 1-800-289-2646. Do it now. You'll be glad that you did.
This is from the Yearbook of the United Nations, 1978, Volume 32, Department of Public Information, United Nations, New York. On page 46, under Political and Security Questions, paragraph 109, Implementation of these priorities should lead to general and complete disarmament under effective international control, which remains the ultimate goal of all efforts exerted in the field of disarmament. Negotiations on general and complete disarmament shall be conducted concurrently with negotiations on partial measures of disarmament. With this purpose in mind, the Committee on Disarmament will undertake the elaboration of a comprehensive program of disarmament encompassing all measures thought to be advisable in order to ensure that the goal of general and complete disarmament under effective international control becomes a reality. In a world in which international peace and security prevail and in which the new international economic order is strengthened and consolidated, the comprehensive program should contain appropriate procedures for ensuring that the General Assembly is kept fully informed of the progress of the negotiations, including an appraisal of the situation when appropriate, and in particular, a continuing review of the implementation of the program. Paragraph 110, progress in disarmament should be accompanied by measures to strengthen institutions for maintaining peace and the settlement of international disputes by peaceful means. During and after the implementation of the program of general and complete disarmament, there should be taken, in accordance with the principles of the Charter of the United Nations, the necessary measures to maintain international peace and security, including the obligation of states to place at the disposal of the United Nations agreed manpower necessary for an international peacekeeping force to be equipped with agreed types of armaments. Arrangements for the use of this force should ensure that the United Nations can effectively deter or suppress any threat or use of arms in violation of the purposes and principles of the United Nations. Paragraph 111. General and complete disarmament under strict and effective international control shall permit states to have at their disposal only those non-nuclear forces, armaments, facilities, and establishments as are agreed to be necessary to maintain internal order and protect the personal security of citizens and in order that states shall support and provide agreed manpower for a United Nations peace force. Under paragraph 115, the General Assembly has been and should remain the main deliberative organ of the United Nations in the field of disarmament and should make every effort to facilitate the implementation of disarmament measures. An effective an item entitled Review of the Implementation of the Recommendations and Decisions Adopted by the General Assembly at its 10th Special Session shall be included in the Provisional Agenda of the 33rd and subsequent sessions of the General Assembly. Paragraph 120, the General Assembly is conscious of the work that has been done by the international negotiating body that has been meeting since 14 March 1962, as well as the considerable and urgent work that remains to be accomplished in the field of disarmament, and on, and on, and on. Paragraph 126, in adopting this final document, the state's members of the United Nations solemnly reaffirm their determination to work for general and complete disarmament and to make further collective efforts aimed at strengthening peace and international security, eliminating the threat of war, particularly nuclear war, implementing practical measures aimed at halting and reversing the arms race, strengthening the procedures for the peaceful settlement of disputes, and reducing military expenditures and utilizing the resources thus released in a manner which will help to promote the well-being of all peoples and to improve the economic conditions of the developing countries. And on. And on. It talks about the new phase in disarmament. And here we have on page 113. Liberia submitted to the First Committee in 1978 a draft resolution on the need for a new philosophy on disarmament to be formulated from the new ideas, theories, proposals, and strategies set forth at the General Assembly's 10th Special and Current Sessions. Liberia envisions, envisions the new philosophy as an organized departure from outmoded premises into a system for mobilizing world public opinion. In other words, propaganda which could make possible a popular grasp of the nature of the disarmament problem 
and United Nations goals on disarmament. Introducing the text, Liberius suggested that all the new ideas and concepts on disarmament should be fused into a single principle of an integrated philosophy, perhaps as a new world disarmament order. Its format, perhaps, as a doctrine or as a philosophical declaration. And down below that, final document of the 10th special session be formulated into a single comprehensive and coordinated system into a new philosophy on disarmament and a message that could effectively reach the minds of men and a mobilization of world public opinion in support of the United Nations goal for halting the arms race and eventually for complete and general disarmament centered on a new order of national and international security. On page 121, on 30 June 1978, at the 10th Special Session, the General Assembly decided to establish a disarmament commission composed of all member states of the United Nations. The commission was asked to report on organizational matters to the Assembly's regular 1978 session. What's wrong with this, folks? You say I'm against peace in the world? Not on your life. You say I'm against world government? No, not if it's done properly. We've been lied to. We've been deceived. We've been manipulated. We've been scammed. Our nation has been stolen out from under us. There are no protections for individual rights in the United Nations Charter or in any of the resolutions passed by the United Nations since its inception. If you take the UN Charter and put it side by side with the old Soviet Constitution, they are the same. The man most responsible for writing the United Nations Charter, ladies and gentlemen, was found to be a communist spy, was tried, convicted, and placed where he belongs, in jail. Who was that? You go dig it out. And the supreme law of the land, ladies and gentlemen, the United States Code annotated, Constitution of the United States annotated, Articles 2 to 7, annotations from federal and state courts. Listen carefully to what I'm telling you. For all of you who have not believed what I've been putting out as the message to this nation and to the world, you had better listen. Once again, United States Code annotated, Constitution of the United States annotated, Articles 2 to 7, annotations from federal and state courts. On page 576, paragraph 112, United Nations Charter. United Nations Charter, a treaty ratified by the United States, is part of the supreme law of this land. U.S. versus Steinberg, D.C., Illinois, 1976, 478, F. Sup. 29. See also Balfour, Guthrie and Company, Limited versus U.S. D.C., Cal, 1950, 90, F. Sup. 831. Provision of United States Nations Charter, that's United Nations Charter, that United Nations should promote universal respect for observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion was not self-executing and therefore was not part of the supreme law of the United States. Do you understand what I'm saying? Camacho versus Rogers, D.C., New York, 1961, 199F, Sup. 155. The United Nations Charter is a treaty within the purview of this clause, making treaties a part of the supreme law of the land and binding upon judges in every state. Fujii versus State, 1952, 242. P. Second, 617, 38. Cal. Second, 718. You can listen to all the other programs you want to. You can read anything you want to. But you better come back every night at this same time and listen to the hour of the time. 
because that's the only way you're ever going to grow up. You get pablum from everyone else. And I have to spoon feed you because you can't get it any other way. 583, paragraph 144, police power enactments. Police power of state, especially when exerted for protection of life and limb, is as pervasive as any of reserved powers of states and should be respected unless there is a clear collision with national law, which has right of way under this clause. Kessler versus Department of Public Safety, Financial Responsibility Division, State of Utah, Utah 1962, 82S Court, 807, 369, U.S. 153, 7L, Ed, 2nd, 641. In the application of this principle of supremacy of an act of Congress in a case where the state law is but the exercise of a reserved power, the repugnance or conflict should be direct and positive, so that the two acts could not be reconciled or consistently stand together, and also that the act of Congress should have been passed in the exercise of a clear power under the Constitution, such as that in question, Sinot versus Davenport, Alabama, 1859, 63, U.S., 227, 22, how? 227, 16, L. Ed. 243. Treaty conflicts generally, 154, paragraph 154 on page 589. Treaty conflicts generally. State law must yield when it is inconsistent with or impairs the policy or provisions of a treaty or of an international compact or agreement. U.S. versus Pink. New York, 1942, 62S Court, 552, 315, U.S. 203, 86, L. Ed. 796. See also, Henry Ostrowski's Estate, 1936, 290. New York State, 174, 160, Miscellaneous, 482, State v. Arthur, 1953, 261, P. 2nd, 135, 74, Idaho, 251. The treaty-making power has been surrendered by the states and given to the United States, and treaties are as binding within the territorial limits of the states as they are elsewhere throughout the domain of the United States. Baldwin v. Franks, Cal, 1887, 7 S. Court, 656, 763, 120, U.S. 682, 30, L. Ed., 766. See also Nielsen v. Johnson, Iowa, 1929, 49, S. Court, 223, 279, U.S. 47, 73, L. Ed., 607, Maurano v. Baltimore, etc. And there's two more paragraphs of citations which I'm not going to read. You can look it up. It is the declared will of the people of the United States that every treaty made by the authority of the United States shall be superior to the Constitution and laws of any individual state. Ware versus Hilton, Virginia, 19, or excuse me, that's Virginia, 1796, 3, U.S., 199, 3, Dahl, 199, 1, L. Ed., 568, see also, N. Re. Wyman, 1906, 77, N. E., 379, 191, Massachusetts, 276, 114, M. S.T. Rep. 601. State statutory provisions yields to any applicable provision of any valid treaty of the United States with foreign country, since treaties constitute part of supreme law of the land. D. Tenorio v. McGowan, C.A. Miss. 1975, 510F2nd, 92, rehearing denied, 513F2nd, 294, Sociorari denied, 96, S. Court, 150, 423, U.S., 877, 46, L. Ed., 2nd, 110. A treaty must be regarded as a part of the law of an individual state as much as are the state's own statutes, and it may override the power of state even in respect of the great body of private relations which usually fall within control of the state. Amea versus Stanilind Oil and Gas Company, CCA Tex, 1947, 158F2nd, 554, Sotirari denied, 67, S Court, 1191, 331, U.S., 808, 
91 L. Ed. 1828. Rehearing denied. 67 S. Court. 1530. 331. U.S. 867. 91 L. Ed. 1871. A treaty is supreme law of the land, and even state law must yield when it is inconsistent with or impairs policy or provisions of a treaty. Oregon Pacific Forest Products Corporation versus Welsh Panel Company, D.C., or 1965-248-F-903. sub You see what I've been telling you? That we don't exist as a country anymore. The Constitution is not in effect. Anywhere that it conflicts with the United Nations Charter, under the United Nations Treaty, and the United Nations Participation Act, the United Nations will prevail. We are a vassal state of a world government and have been since 1945. State cannot attempt to exercise jurisdiction if to do so would violate an international treaty. Shoai Keiko Company Limited versus Superior Court for City and County of San Francisco, 1973, 109, Cal, Reptor, 402-33, CA, 3rd, 808. A duly executed treaty is the supreme law of the land and state and local laws must yield to its provisions. Republic of Finland versus Town of Pelham, 1966-270. NY, S, 2nd, 661, 26, AD, 2nd, 35. States are bound by this clause to respect the terms of treaties entered into by Congress. State versus Miller, 1984, 689. P, 2nd, 81, 102, Washington, 2nd, 678. State laws must yield to valid treaties where there is a conflict between them, and even laws governing essentially local matters must bow when treaty provisions override them. Wires v. Arnold's, 1941, 147, SW, 2nd, 644, 347, Missouri, 413, Certiorari denied, 61, S. Court, 1112, 313, U.S. 589, 85, L.S. 1544, page 591, paragraph 172, sovereign immunity generally. The federal government, its agencies, and instrumentalities have general sovereign immunity under this clause from state or local control of governmental functions. Mon v. U.S. C.A. Cal 1965, 347, F. 2nd, 970. Implied federal governmental immunity from state regulation extends to the performance of governmental activities or functions by federal instrumentalities, federal officers and agents, Beauregard Elect Co-op Incorporated v. Louisiana Public Service Commission, L.A. 1979, 378, S.O. 2nd, 404, and on and on and on. I could cite cases all night in front of this microphone showing you what I am talking about and what I have been trying to tell you and what you have been ignoring for years. Basic documents in international law and world order. Listen to this. Basic documents in international law and world order. Burns a... H. Weston, Richard A. Falk, Anthony A. Diamato. Page 138, paragraph 2.25. Final Act of the United Nations General Assembly Special Session on Disarmament. Adopted by consensus on June 30, 1978. Adopts the following final document of this special session of the General Assembly devoted to disarmament. Ladies and gentlemen, you can look it up. We're out of time. We'll continue this tomorrow night, if I'm still alive. Good night. God bless each and every one of you. And God save this republic.